Yeah, Kei Tsutat, Shodakat Yuhan. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's really nice that Dr. Wapit talked about stress responses this morning. As I think we're definitely feeling that leading up to this presentation, so maybe we can just ha 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 it off here as we start. Um, my name is Peter Stanton. And I am Rebecca Bolin, and both of us teach in the Ketchikan Gateway Borough School District at Ketchikan High School. And this morning, we'd like to have you take a look at the topic of integration and specialization. In other words, two different paths for having more culturally responsive courses in our schools. Are we going to take courses that already exist and integrate more culturally responsive practices into them? Or are we going to create new specialized courses that offer those opportunities? And of course, our answer, spoiler alert, is both. Of course, you should do both. And that's why we're going to map out and show you some uh, ways forward with both of these paths. We'd also like to begin by just uh, stating Shinget Ani Ayah, Gunna Chish, Shinget Kwani Ka, Ak Kwan, Ak Kwan Ani Kach. So we just like to acknowledge and um, express our gratitude for the Shinget people for their stewardship of this land, and in particular the Ak Kwan, whose land we are standing on. And then we'll also say Gunas Chish Hauta and Toyaxit Newsom to all the people who have inspired and supported us and brought us to this point where we would feel confident enough, in spite of that stress response, <laughs> to present to you on this topic today. And those individuals in particular are the collective body of those folks who work with the Alaska Heritage Institute. Um, and then in particular for where we live in southern southeast Alaska, Irene Dundas, whom you met earlier on stage, and Teresa Varnell. Um, truly both of them um, are an inspiration for me um, to continue in this work with students. And I am profoundly grateful for both the Alaska and my colleagues and friends from Ketchikan. Rebecca Bolin, Ka Peter Stanton, Yuha Duasak, Kichhunk Yehayati, Kuatlatu Hasati. So our names are Rebecca Bolin and Peter Stanton. We live in Ketchikan, uh, Kichhan, and we are teachers there. Uh, I have been teaching um, in Ketchikan, it'll be 30 years this October. Uh, this is the start of my 36th year of teaching. I am probably proof positive um, that everyone who is truly an educator is a lifelong learner. There are always things that we can keep learning um, and to encourage you to um, never be satisfied with doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and uh, I would also like to say that um, it's kind of fun being up on stage with someone that I taught because Peter was a student of mine at Ketchikan High School, so. I'll say the reverse. It's, it's great to be up here with one of my former teachers and to reflect on um, the, the journey that I've been on. Um, I've finished my eighth year of teaching in Ketchikan Gateway Borough School District, and I'm excited to keep continuing my professional journey, too. So, now it's time for all of you to take a turn here. We've got a survey for you as we begin um, so that you can start thinking about your understandings and your abilities when it comes to integrating culturally responsive methods into courses or potentially creating new courses in your school settings. Um, if everybody could take out a piece of paper if you've got something handy. I suppose you could also type it on a device. Um, and then if anybody is without 
um, materials to write on. We've got some note cards. So please just raise your hand if you need me to come bring you a note card. Otherwise, get yourself a piece of paper and a pen. So the first question, just take a moment to think and reflect on how are existing courses at your school structured around multiple cultural perspectives? Whether you um, know this because of your own teaching um, in the classroom or around you in your building or district. Okay, wrap up thinking about how you might respond to this, and we'll be heading into the second question in a moment. Full disclosure, being on stage terrifies me. I teach children for a reason. They're not scary, adults are. <laughs> no. Question two. Please reflect on how do students in your school learn course content through multiple cultural perspectives. Are there any moments, any memories that come to mind, things that you see in your school? Uh, three, this is the final one where you need to write out. We have a couple that are more just grading yourself. What courses at your school do you feel already successfully integrate multiple cultural perspectives into their content? As best you can answer. Obviously, we don't always know exactly what goes on in other content areas at our schools. Just make a list of the courses that come to mind. Or, or if you're in an elementary context, it could be particular subjects or activities throughout the day that you think successfully integrate those perspectives. So questions four and five, our final questions, are mostly you're rating yourself for your own purposes from on a one to five scale. Uh, question four, how confident are you in your ability to integrate multiple cultural perspectives into your course content? Uh, rating yourself uh, from one, not at all confident, to a five, extremely confident. Confident. Although you could put that one in there, I'll grant you that, Kaplan. You could be confident and incompetent. Yes. You might, but you might not know. Yes. So. And that's where we get into good intentions. So. And then the last. Um, survey question, again, rating from on a one to five scale. How confident are you in your ability to create a new course that focuses on multiple cultural perspectives for your school? And it may be that you've never had the opportunity to do this or you haven't even thought about an opportunity like this to create a new course. Um, but imagine it. How confident would you be to go through that process?
Okay, at this point we are going to have you um, get into four, I think there's enough for four healthy sized groups here. Peter's going to hand out a large sheet of paper and some markers. Um, what we'd like you to do is um, break up into four different groups um, and discuss some of the things that came up in these survey questions um, and then on the sheet of um, paper, uh, if you could list out one to two takeaways from your discussion, just based on the survey at this point, um, and then we'll have each group have a spokesperson to share at the microphones on the floor. All right, goodness, Chi Xu Han. Thanks, y'all. Um, I am really looking forward to hearing uh, at least a few takeaways from anybody who'd be willing to share what you discussed in your group, things that came up, things that you thought about uh, the, the culturally responsive courses or content that does exist at your school, or uh, your confidence in providing that yourself, anything else that came up in your group discussions. So for the people here in person, if you could come down to one of the microphones, if you're willing to share some of these takeaways, we'd really love to hear that. And for those of you who are on Zoom, if it's possible, if you could show your lovely visage, your lovely face, so that we can see you here in person as well you will have an opportunity to share um, when we get to that point. Thank you. All right. Can you prompt me again, please? We just wanted to hear sure. one or okay. more of your takeaways. All right, well, we really appreciated the whole box of markers. Um, so we really talked about how um, it's really not institutionalized, this multiple perspectives focus and that we see individual teachers throughout the state who are really good at it, but maybe not, um, but that's it, right? So if you do it, you do it, and if you don't, you don't. Um, so not institutionalized, it's not a graduation requirement. Um, uh, the Juno School District uh, Social Studies Standard does have a small uh, like unit on perspective. I do it and it's become a theme throughout my classes. I don't know if other people do it and I don't, and I don't think that's true you know, for other um, content areas. Um, different, I also don't know who even looks at the district standards to be honest, so there you go. Um, different teachers but not schools, right? School-wide we're not seeing a perspective concept but again, like students know, there are classrooms where we're gonna talk about different perspectives. Um, and then we offer these things and we kind of check the box by saying, we offer electives, we have this language, we have native carving, like you can do it, but really can you do it? Like can everybody do it? Is it inclusive? Is it accessible? Um, and then we also like have alternative schools where their um, systems are built so that they can do more hands-on learning or more like integrative projects, but like in the, you know, at this school, at Thunder Mountain, like it would be more difficult because of the structure of the school day. Um, and then uh, in our cloud, we have um, not enough time to plan, to collaborate, to teach, or to actually implement. Uh, not a statewide standard, right, culturally revolved, culturally relevant or multiple perspectives, like it's not a standard, it's something we're talking about, but it's a parallel, it doesn't uh, cross into like what we're doing. And then I like rain, but I made the rain bad, even though I like rain. Uh, so not required, not integrated, uh, small populations benefit from these electives. Uh, it's not supported by our administration, even though we talk about it, uh, and it's not inclusive. What was your name? Uh, I'm, my name is Mara, I'm early and I teach at Thunder Mountain. Oh, yeah, of course. Mara. Do we have anybody else in person? 
person who wanted to share some of their takeaways. Or on Zoom, you could go ahead and unmute and share. Um, our group wandered around a little more. Um, one of the things we, I had to echo some of the things Mara said, is like very, uh, in our schools we see it very room to room and not, it's not a, uh, you know, it's not systemic and it's, uh, it kind of depends on the groups of teachers. We teach in teams, so depending on your team makeup, you're more successful at it or not. Um, one of the things that I kind of ranted about is the use of resources. We get these every year generic throwaway uh, language arts books that cost a bunch of money and we could be getting so many better materials that are relevant to Alaska um, that, yeah, drives us a little crazy. Uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, one of the things like local-based materials, for instance, uh, one of the group members just been up in Nome and they were raising the question, why do we fly, for, you know, frogs all the way to Nome to dissect instead of dissecting some of the things in the environment? Um, and also, was one of the things we talked about is um, like in Juneau, when we talk about culture, we tend to only think Clinton or Southeast. But you know, like a few years ago, um, the largest group in, for instance, my homeroom was all, was Filipino, I had 12 Filipino kids out of that, you know, 26 homeroom. And so we did some specifically Filipino projects. Because, you know, we do, we actually, it's uh, certainly when I first moved to Juneau, I'm from Detroit, not Juneau. When I first moved to Juneau in 1997, one of the things that surprised me was the diversity here we have that, you know, wasn't expecting to have Filipino and Samoan and as well as native and white. So um, we talked some about, yeah, making sure we're getting all those perspectives. So, yeah. And what was your name? Uh, James, James Chico. Goodness, cheese, James. Okay, and we'd like to hear from Caitlin on Zoom. Hello, everyone. Wow, I think my video is very large for you. Um, well, we talked about, our, our big takeaway from our discussion was that you don't have to change everything all at once, but it's important to start somewhere. And Robbie talked a bit about the program in Juno um, for violin students where the, the instructors who are, I think mostly non-native just decided they wanted to incorporate language. And so they started learning words for the parts of the violin and different commands that they use with their students. And they, they use Klingit now instead of English. And that's just a way of the integrating version of um, what the presenters are talking about, taking something that's already happening and integrating culture into it. And then we also talked about um, kind of my, my role at the middle school in Sitka was to the other thing where we created a new course, a STEAM elective based on Clinket ways of knowing and being. Um, Anyone else want to add anything? I think that was the main thing was start somewhere. Goodness, cheese, Caitlin, those are perfect examples. And I just, I just want to tell you, my son was in that class and he didn't know the word for violin. It was only hip chop. He only knew it in Clinket. It was so cool. Caitlin, did you hear that? No. Oh, okay. Mara was saying that her, her, her son only, your son, right? Yeah. Only knew the word in Sengit for violin. Yeah. Didn't even know the word violin. Shikuzi. <laughs> Robbie said that was a really hard word, but all the students were able to learn it. So there were wider effects from creating that STEAM course. Awesome. Awesome. And then we maybe have one more person who was going to share with us. So in addition to the talking points other groups went over, one of the concepts that we discussed was just having a lot of interactions between students and having them exploring their identities and sharing that like, with each other and taking ownership of their classroom really allowed them to share perspectives with each other. 
um, bringing people in like guest speakers, um, elders, creating panels is awesome, but also takes like a tremendous, tremendous amount of time and coordination and resources and sometimes funding. So that's great. I wish that I had more time to like, you know, to make that happen. Um, we talked about using like arts and current events to make, you know, kids aware of different cultures throughout the world. We wish we had more chances to collaborate with other teachers, right, and um, community partners, also a huge challenge. And um, I could go on and on, but those are just a couple points that we discussed in my group. Goodness, cheese. Thank you so much, everybody, for sharing those takeaways. Um, it really sounds like that there already are some amazing things going on in your schools, your school districts, um, ideas that you have, ideas that you may already be implementing, and that's amazing, that's wonderful. We love hearing that and um, love getting everybody thinking about this as we go into the rest of our presentation. Uh, hopefully, the examples that we can give you today will help you further some of your ideas, give you more material to reflect on. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna get started on the first path, integration. So if you already have existing courses, courses that are required, essential, or courses that simply are established in your school that you want to teach or that students want to teach, what are the ways in which we can truly integrate and restructure those courses so that they always and consistently include place-based and culturally relevant perspectives. Hopefully I can give you some good ideas and some things to reflect on. So here are a few essential questions that I'd like to start out with. First of all, how can we structure courses around multiple cultural perspectives rather than just one dominant perspective. And I bold that word structure because we want to avoid that pitfall of simply adding on a few perspectives at the end of a unit or in one unit. Things that aren't going to feel to students as if they're an essential part of the course. How can we restructure these existing important courses so that those perspectives, that cultural content is there throughout? Secondly, how can we engage students in learning course content through multiple cultural perspectives? So it may be that you have a great idea to restructure a course on paper and on that curriculum sheet, it looks like it really is multicultural through and through, but students may not engage with it. That's a possibility too. So we wanna make sure that they're engaging with it. And then we, when we offer them those other cultural lenses, the students actually take the time and have the ability to look through those lenses. And then lastly, I um, ask, how can we ask students to analyze, discuss, and reflect on course content while viewing it from those new perspectives? So just adding on, moving up that uh, hierarchy of learning. So to start us off with this idea of integration, how we may think about these questions and apply them, I'm gonna use the example of the required Alaska history or Alaska studies course. And it was pretty fortuitous hearing Representative Story um, mention that in her speech to us a little while ago. You know, she talked about multi, uh, culturally responsive education not necessarily being a graduation requirement, but then she mentioned, well, except for the Alaska Native Studies course. And, and that may have been just a little slip of the tongue there, but it is not an Alaska Native Studies course. The text of the state legislation is that it is an Alaska history course, uh, one half credit required for almost all Alaska graduates. There are a few exceptions where you can get away with not taking that high school class. But otherwise, this is a course that's required across the entire state of Alaska that almost all Alaska high school graduates will have to take. And on the one hand, this might seem like a really easy course to address. Well, it's Alaska history, it's Alaska studies. Of course, you're going to learn about Alaska's native peoples. Of course, there have got to be 
multicultural perspectives integrated into that course. Mm, maybe that's not always true. Um, and then reflecting back on those questions that I mentioned, maybe the course is not always structured so that students really engage with those perspectives throughout the entirety of the course. So those are a few things to think about. And I'll also note that across many, if not most, school districts in Alaska, this course is usually called Alaska Studies, and it's usually taken by ninth grade students in high schools. So I wanted to just do a quick comparison. You certainly don't need to read through all of this, but I wanted to take uh, the three largest communities in Alaska, um, or largest school districts, Anchorage, Fairbanks, and Juneau. My Alaska Studies students learned that those are the three most populated cities in Alaska. And I wanted to take a look at what their curriculum says. So just to summarize really quickly, Anchorage and Fairbanks both call this course Alaska Studies. Um, their curriculum includes these general themes related to Alaska's geography, population, land, resources, governance, and culture. The Fairbanks course includes a little bit more emphasis on civics um, as part of that social studies. Uh, social studies learning objectives. And then lastly, Juno, I found the most interesting and I'd love to, to learn more about the specifics of what's being taught with the Alaska History course in Juno, but it is specifically called Alaska History rather than Alaska Studies. And as Mara mentioned, it also aimed, it spells out these pretty specific units, most of which focus on specific historical time periods, um, but then there's also uh, a perspectives unit in the curriculum there too. So when I think about these curricula, just looking at the evidence I can find from different school districts, of course it doesn't show exactly what teachers are doing in their classrooms, but it does highlight a few potential pitfalls that I can envision, and I know these because I've experienced them myself. So. Uh, back in 2014, I was student teaching um, along with Kaplan and our awesome UAS MAT program. <laughs> and uh, one of the courses that I observed and then taught as a student teacher was the Alaska Studies course at Ketchikan High School. And the, the structure that I picked up from my mentor teachers and that I followed because it made perfect sense to me was to keep the course, which is just a short semester long course, relatively simple, focused on big topical themes that students needed to learn about social studies. So I had a geography unit, the geography of Alaska, a history unit, Alaska's history, and then we took the last third of the course to look at current issues, the politics, the economics, the social issues, the things uh, that students would want to know about going on in Alaska right now. So that tripartite structure made perfect sense to me. It was simple, straightforward, should be easy for students to understand, and of course, learning about Alaska's native peoples was included in the course, but it was wedged in. By the time we finished with our geography unit, or as we were finishing with our geography unit, we used that to talk about the different regions that Alaska's native peoples lived in, and then we moved on to Alaska's history and talked about those cultural precedents before Russians arrived and began trying to colonize Alaska, right? So it, it made sense to me. Keep the structure simple and proceed in this somewhat chronological or topical way throughout this short Alaska Studies class. But, <laughs> As I thought about this structure and as I used it several times in teaching this Alaska Studies course, I realized students were missing out. They were moving from one way of thinking about Alaska as this geographic entity to thinking just about its history to thinking just about the things in the news. And along the way, learning about where different Alaska Native peoples lived and their histories and cultures, that was wedged in there. One of the things I tried to do as a student teacher and, and was able to successfully implement is that I also did integrate uh, vocabulary in Tlingit, which I had started learning 
in, in the year or two before that. I, I did incorporate Sengit vocabulary throughout, connecting it with different topics the students were learning. You know, for example, we learned about the Alaska earthquake, the, the Great Alaska earthquake, and then we'd learn the word you on ka'a, or Sengit for earthquake, right? So that was one way where I wanted to expose students to a different way of thinking about these concepts, learning it in a different language, thinking about those um, grammar elements of a word like you on ka'a, which is very interesting. And I, I wanted to open up their minds by incorporating that vocabulary, but that still, it didn't feel like enough. Students were not engaging with those perspectives. They were not viewing Alaska through those perspectives consistently throughout the course. So the question that pushed me to change was not whether Alaska Native cultures were present in the course. Of course they were, and I made sure that they were. But rather, was the course structure really something that helped the students engage? And, and so I think one pitfall here is to fall into this compartmentalized Euro-American view of academic subjects. We were putting everything in the course into these silos of geography, history, and current events, economics, political science, and so on. How did I restructure? Well, don't get scared. I, I tried not to make this diagram too complicated, but I wanted to try to illustrate what I did to restructure. And I, and I used this new structure just this past year, spent a lot of time thinking about it, and I think it has been and was pretty successful. So the way that I restructured my Alaska Studies course at Ketchikan High School was to make sure that in every single unit of study, students had multiple opportunities to see content through other cultural perspectives. I wanted it to be present in every single part of the course from the beginning of the semester to the end. So I'll try to explain my diagram as simply as possible. <laughs> Instead of taking this topical siloed approach, just three simple parts, geography, history, current issues, I instead wanted to have my students travel around the state from region to region and in each region see that geography, history, and current issues through the perspectives of the native cultures there in those regions. So if you can follow the arrows, we start out in Western Alaska and there's geography, history, and current issues present there as we learn about Western Alaska. Then we move up to the North Slope in Nupiak, Northern Alaska. Then we move down into uh, Dene, Athabaskan, South Central, uh, Interior and South Central Alaska. Then we move to Singet Ani and uh, the Haida and Simshan people of Southern Southeast as well. And then move over to Southwest Alaska and the Sukpek and the Unungan people. After traveling around Alaska, I then wanted to avoid taking this strictly chronological path through Alaska's history. Instead, I wanted to zoom out on the concepts in Alaska history that I felt were most essential for the students to take away. Um, honestly, I, I love Alaska's history. I'm incredibly passionate about it, but I don't exactly need my students to know these dates that the gold rushes happened, these dates that uh, different immigrant groups started coming to Alaska, I didn't need to follow a strictly chronological approach. So instead, my remaining three units of the course were these big thematic ones of colonization, looking at both Russian and American colonization in Alaska's history, then settlement, immigration, and assimilation, which is especially where I have been trying to bring in more perspectives from settlers and immigrants along with Alaska's native peoples in terms of how they all experienced those pressures of assimilation and settlement differently. And then lastly, we get to law and politics in Alaska today and, and how everything comes together with some of those uh, tough current issues that we face. And over on the side, you can see that I'm still integrating some get vocabulary throughout and we connect that um, the students learn about 20 vocabulary terms in, in Tlingit by the end of the course. So they'll be able to 
you know, respond when I ask them wasayati every morning. And uh, they'll come away from the course knowing that they have learned at least a tiny bit of the, the language of the land that they live on. So that's my restructuring of this course, which uh, hopefully answers some of those questions and those things that I felt were missing. Just to tie it all together and, and illustrate what this looks like in a unit, I'll just talk about my first unit in the course, which is Yupik, Western Alaska. And I felt it was really important to start in Western Alaska because it's a region of this land that I have never personally visited. And living in Ketchikan, most of my students have never visited Western Alaska and are pretty unlikely to at some point in their lives. So I felt it was important to start strong here to give students perspectives on this land um, that they would be completely unfamiliar with. So we start out by looking at the geography of Western Alaska, noticing the yukon Kuskokwim Delta, the unique geography there, its importance, thinking about where those communities are located around the region, why those communities are there, and then also how they may be threatened, how they are threatened by global climate change, rising sea levels, and all these environmental changes going on in Alaska and around the world. We then take one of those communities and look just a little away. There's a village named Kinhagak, south of Bethel, and there's an archaeological site right on the coast of the Bering Sea. And then we use this amazing interactive game called Nunasak, based on the archaeological site Nunasak, and the students are able to explore that, learning about Yupik culture as shown through that archaeological site that is being threatened, is being washed away um, as we speak. Um, we then read from Yuyarak, the um, text by Harold Napoleon, to help the students understand a little bit more about that traditional Yupik worldview of the land, of the spirits that are present in it. And, you know, in Ketchikan, uh, maybe this is an elephant in the room, but we've come up just in the past few weeks in this idea that uh, talking about traditional beliefs of Alaska Native peoples is in some way uh, teaching students religious precepts. And, and there is a lawsuit that has been filed against the Ketchikan Gateway Borough School District connected to this. Um, but you know, I just, I wanna say, when I teach about these Yupik beliefs or the beliefs of other Alaska Native peoples, this is essential for students to be able to see the world through other lenses, through other perspectives. I am not telling students to believe a certain religious precept. It is not inappropriate to talk about these beliefs in the classroom. So I feel very strongly about this, and um, that's, that's why I'm incorporating it into this required course. Then um, we bring it up to the present and look at the communities in Western Alaska today, what life is like, and then we look at a pretty sensationally titled article that came out in the Atlantic a few years ago when global warming kills your God. So we're bringing together those ideas of traditional beliefs and connection to the land and to um, hunting and fishing on that land, as well as the impacts of global climate change. So at every point throughout this short unit of learning about Western Alaska, I'm asking students to view things from the perspective of the people who live there um, from the past up to the present day. And, and that's just one example of how I'm, in, uh, how I'm working continuously to integrate these perspectives into this required course. So we're now gonna move on pretty quickly to looking at just a few suggestions, a few ideas of how integration will work in other courses. Again, some of you may feel like, well, that's Alaska studies, of course. Alaska Native people are present. It didn't take you that much work to take content about Alaska Native peoples and make that a bit more culturally responsive. I get that. So looking at other courses, a um, couple quick questions for you. Are multiple cultural perspectives already present in the course? Hopefully so, but if not, 
got to get those perspectives at least present ASAP. And then second, if other perspectives are already present in the course, how could that course be better structured so that students really have those repeated, sustained opportunities to engage with those perspectives? So they, they know this isn't just a one time off to the side. It's just, yeah, we just threw that unit in there for fun, um, but it's really a critical part of the course. Um, like Senator Murkowski said, we want place-based education to be at the center, not off to the side. So I'm going to give a few general, very general recommendations for a uh, few subjects here, and then we'll get into more specifics. Um, in social studies and English language arts, you want to think about the narratives that structure those courses, right? We're telling stories, whether it's from the past and hopefully nonfiction, or whether it's from literature or things that students need to read and write. Um, whose points of view are represented in those narratives that not only structure the course, but are also present throughout the course? And then in math and science courses, not my forte, but um, that knowledge that students are gaining about math and science, that belongs in a historic and cultural context. I'm not just trying to get math and science teachers to teach more history, but they belong in a context and students should be able to see that knowledge through the perspectives that uh, formed that knowledge and that use that knowledge in the present day. And then uh, a lot of the skills and concepts that students acquire in those types of courses, they can be applied in place-based ways. And hopefully, um, students will see that as part of the purpose of the course, that application in their cultural context, in their geographic context, their home. And then lastly, with electives, of course, this is highly variable, depending on the subject, but uh, any subject that we teach in school has relevance or should have relevance to our students and to their cultural context. So we want to make sure that we're demonstrating that and asking students to apply their knowledge and skills in place-based ways. So for social studies, I'll quickly explain, you know, I'm not a one-trick pony, hopefully. I'm not just trying to implement these sorts of practices and methodologies only in my Alaska Studies course. But when we think about sort of standard social studies courses like US history, world history, or uh, US government or civics, um, some of the goals, the general goals across these courses that I would have would be to make sure to always connect or connect as often as possible the local to the regional to the global so that students in a US history course are not always on this one Zoom setting where they're only thinking about the United States as this abstract country that they live in, but they're connecting those concepts from US history to things that have happened in their town, to things that have happened in Alaska, to things that were going on around the world. We also want to connect students' identities to these important narratives that happen in these courses. When we're learning about world history, uh, students often don't care. <laughs> I experience it firsthand, right? But if it was their ancestors or their uh, parents' home that was affected by these trends and uh, you know, major events in world history, hopefully they might start to understand a little bit more why they should care. Um, and the images that I have here off to the side highlight how I have been attempting, and I'm absolutely going to keep working on this, bringing Filipino history into all of these places throughout our social studies courses. And, and you know, there's so much rich Filipino history that is part of the United States and its culture um, from centuries ago up to the present and is part of world history. And, um, connected to, obviously, our, our politics and government as well. So just a few other approaches, things that I have thought about. I don't have concrete units to show you, but uh, I thought about how we can better teach black history as a driving force in US history, to teach US history through that lens, the black perspective. 
um, or many black perspectives, um, even in communities or perhaps especially in communities where students have not had much opportunity to look at things through uh, black perspectives. And then, as I mentioned earlier, looking at the Philippines as central to the modern global economy, to world history, and to U.S. history. And then another example would be uh, something that I thought about a lot and hope to be able to implement, um, looking at tribal government as critical to understanding federal and state laws in a government or civics class. So the, those are just a few examples, things that I am working on and thinking about all the time. And now I'm gonna let Rebecca take over and take us over to her part of the academic world in English language arts. It's being, it's being a little funky here. Okay, so, uh, in the English department at the high school, I'm just gonna say this too, I don't think it should be called English. I think it should be called literature and writing. Um, because <laughs> we need to get into the, the, the idea, which is very much grounded, that stories are universal, and how we teach those stories as universal and have value and worth to all that we serve is very critical, and that's like a very personal thing for me, but that's just where I'm coming from. But um, for the sake of this, it's still called ELA, so uh, I would, I just have um, breaking down of specific examples, and I'll run through these very quickly, and I do know that the slideshow presentation will be available for you if you want to see it, or you'll be able to email us if you want more information. Um, because we are running low on time and we don't want to keep you from your lunch break. That's about 28 minutes long. Um, anyway, uh, so I'm fortunate to have four of the six um, ELA staff at our high school have taken, ooh, have taken the um, Sea Alaska Through the Cultural Lens course. Um, I was the first one to take it a couple years back. Um, since then, I've been asked to be a mentor for it and then work with other um, people throughout southern southeast Alaska who do take the course and help to develop their um, units of study using the understanding by design of backward design and essential questions format of lesson planning. Um, so these are just like one example from each grade level of how it's being incorporated and again the goal is to have this be intuitive um, and through, woven throughout a school year, our English one and our English two are year-long courses. Uh, aside from AP courses of language and literature, um, our junior-senior courses are semester-based and content area-based, um, which is a little different from most of the places around the state. Um, so you'll see that in a moment. So for English one, again, you can see this already here. Um, uh, two of the English one teachers put together a unit on oral tradition and storytelling from southern southeast Alaska and the, with the goal in mind of putting it into the larger short story unit of study that's required for our ELA curriculum. Our English two instructor who has taken the social, uh, the, through the cultural lens course, she, um, our English two is a general overview of world literature. Um, Interestingly enough, there's no world literature that focuses on Native American or Native Alaskan literature in our materials or our textbook, but uh, we do have a vast library in our department that she can pull from for this. But so she took it from a different way. She used the traditional tribal values when she was teaching the play Antigone and used it as a way to compare values across time and history and place. Um, and part of that, too, was the time frame in which the cultural lens course was happening. It was happening around the same time that she was going to be teaching this. Um, she is going to incorporate that into um, with, uh, with other units of study as well for English, too. Uh, AP Language and Composition, I teach this course. Um, it has, for as long as I have taught it, I have always integrated uh, nonfiction um, essays from Native Alaskans and Native Americans um, and others across the 
across the world um, into this particular course. Um, since uh, within the past few years, we have added um, the autobiography memoir, Crazy Brave, by our former poet laureate, Joy Harjo, as well as Blonde Indian by Ernestine Hayes for local and then reaching out, regional, global, and then coming back to local. Brit Lit is a challenge. And this year when I had British literature for a semester, um, I, I was like, how do you do this? I want to be able to do this, that is natural. It's not gonna be dropped in. And instead of having thematic units, I just chose a theme for the whole semester, and that theme was battles. And I allowed students with the text that we have, they chose what they wanted to study from each of the units in there. But then I also wanted to add colonization in there so that they could have a perspective of the United States isn't the only place that is colonized, and we have Britain, and taking it from that, that perspective. And when you think about British literature and British history and British colonization, what come, came to mind for me was um, what they called the jewel in the crown when they colonized India. And, you know, rightly or wrongly, I'm thinking to myself, well, I live in a place that I love, and I would consider Alaska to be the jewel in the crown of the United States, and so took it kind of from that perspective. Um, but giving the students ownership into what we're going to study, I had 23 students in that class, and four of them were girls. We weren't going to do Jane Austen. Thank you very much. Um, but just the idea of having a whole semester as a theme and weaving it through is another way to go about it as opposed to unit uh, units of study. This was a unit that we did within. and. Two of my favorite ones that came out of this um, project doing their um, coat of arms when studying that with medieval history was a student, a senior, and she, um, she went and researched the Tagalog equivalent of medieval writings at the time and used that as her motto and wrote everything in that medieval uh, equivalent of Tagalog for hers. So that was a beautiful thing to see. And then I had a student who had no culture. And my Simshian student said, dude, what's your favorite food? And they built this relationship around food. And he helped him create his coat of arms because we do have students who don't feel that they have a culture at all. So uh, social justice literature, a unit of title from that is resiliency in the face of adversity. It's a literary circle unit. And the artwork that I show here comes from two different texts that they had read as a class. They had read Two Old Women by Velma Wallace. Um, and then as a lit circle option, they had read Rabbit Proof Fence by Doris Pilkington about the stolen generation from Australia. And this particular student is an art student and she compared the two old women with being cast aside to the two of the three children in the story of Robert Proof Fence and both of their journeys and their parallel journeys. So making those local connections and taking them out globally and bringing them back also creates a lot of ownership and showing that we are not always so alone in the world where we are. It, other people around the country and around the world experience it as well. World mythology. Um, I have the fortunate um, well, I'm fortunate to have a textbook that has a lot of Native Alaskan and Native American um, myths in it, in div divided into creation myths, fertility myths, and um, heroic myths. So uh, this I use as a whole, I'm sorry, um, as a uh, thematically three different themes, but then we start locally, branch out, and then come back. So we have that full circle. And then we have our electives, um, and I'm going to hand that back over to Peter for a little bit. Yeah, you know, again, it's 
extremely topical to bring this up in, in light of the lawsuit that was filed just a couple weeks ago, but uh, we have a health teacher, ninth, ninth grade course at Ketchikan High School, and she recently implemented this unit of taking Southeast Alaska tribal values and uh, having students in, engage with those as part of um, thinking about uh, their values and their lives as part of that health curriculum. Then um, branching into some science courses, uh, there was a unit created as part of the SHI through the Cultural Lens um, course uh, related to water quality in the marine biology class. And of course, I'm sure those of you who are science teachers, you can think of many different possibilities and opportunities like this of taking um, important scientific concepts and uh, applying them in a place-based way like this. And then uh, to take an elective example, um, it was really exciting to see some collaboration, some synergy going on in some of our elective courses at Ketchikan High School um, that you wouldn't necessarily connect, um, but we had one teacher uh, teaching culinary arts, another teacher, um, our, our choir teacher, also teaching a stagecraft course, and they were able to bring those classes together and have those students work together on a, a unit about storytelling through food and performance. So they conducted interviews, they made recipes, they brought together these things from, from their families and from other cultures and um, made some pretty beautiful and, and delicious things as part of that unit. So these are just a few examples of integration. I hope that gave you some food for thought. And we know that maybe that we've got about 18 to 20 minutes left, but uh, this is a long presentation. So please, everybody, feel free to get up and stretch for a few seconds here, including everybody on Zoom. Go ahead and get up and stretch. And then we will conclude with the final portion on specialization in creating new courses. Alrighty. Um, so this portion is pretty straightforward and um, it's on specialization on crafting a, a new course that isn't offered yet at your school. Um, and in, just please know that I am not presuming that you don't know how to put courses together. It's just looking throughout the state of Alaska, at least for the ELA departments, it's pretty standard that it's English 1, English 2, English 3, English 4, with a few exceptions. Um, and so 20 years ago at Ketchikan High School, we decided that we would go away from the English 3 American literature and English 4 British literature framework and create content area based courses. Um, do we still touch on American lit, Brit lit, world lit, multicultural perspectives? Yes, but they're in content area based courses. Mm -hmm. We have things such as the world mythology class, the social justice class, literature into film, um, <clears throat> excuse me, short stories, British lit, world lit, um, folklore and fairy tale, things like that. Um, we, we have an Asian lit class, uh, but for whatever reason, Nobody thought to add a Na Native American literature course. And it had been on my mind. We do have m a lot of Native American literature in our department already. And it was um, sprinkled throughout the courses, but we thought, I felt a few years back, it's very important to add it in. And so having had gone through the experience of building the content area courses um, for the past 20 years, I felt comfortable or confident in my abilities to use that prior framework to build this Native American literature course. Um, and Peter as well, at the same time I was uh, crafting the Native American literature course, he was putting together the Indigenous History of North America course for the Social Studies Department. So these are just going through the steps and protocols, and then I have a, a sample course description. If you haven't had to write a course description that not only meets school board approval, but also meets NCAA approval, 
for those student athletes because that can come back to bite you if they don't accept your course as NCAA approved. We don't have that many at Ketch in Ketchikan that go on, but every once in a while, well, hey, you need to rework this. And you only get one chance to rework your course description before they say no. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, so steps and protocols. Step number one, first and foremost, ask permission. Um, as a non-native individual who at, you know, is genuine in, in wanting to learn and be more um, involved in all aspects of what I teach to my students um, and who those students are in the classroom. Um, it's important that we acknowledge that we need to ask that permission and where we start is with our knowledge bearers. Uh, for me, um, those knowledge bearers are Teresa Varnell, who you met earlier, um, our district's cultural coordinator, and Dr. Priscilla Schulte. She is the campus director for the UAS branch in Ketchikan. Um, and then again, your immediate supervisors. Of course, um, sometimes asking them permission to do things is a bit difficult, but um, for me, uh, the Ketchikan High School principal also um, has taken the cultural lens course and said was very supportive. So if you have um, administrative support, you should be good to go in that, in that regard. And then of course, your um, ELA department chair in, in that case for, for my department. Uh, step number two, you do need to follow administrative directives. Um, and they are given to you once you're told, yes, you can do this, but these are the things that you need to put together in order for us to submit this to um, the powers that be, which is ultimately your school board for approval, um, at least in Ketchikan. I don't know how that might work in other school districts. So creating a course description and course outcomes, um, cross-reference state standards and performance objectives, provide materials, a reading list, and the cost of those materials. Fortunately for KHI, we had a lot of materials already in place. It was just making sure that we did a thorough inventory of how we could put much of that into the course as well as continue to share it with other courses. Um, the chain of approval, at least in Ketchikan. Um, knowledge bearers, administration at the building level, department chair, curriculum director, superintendent, and then ultimately the school board signs off on approval. and just an outline of how that might look. And again, um, I believe Ben is sharing this with folks to, if they need, if they would like it, so. So here's a sample course description. Um, I do have the pink highlighted. For me, this was very important that every single piece of literature, except for two, mm -hmm. I have, are written by Native Alaskan and Native American authors. Um, one of those being Rabbit Proof Fence from uh, Australia and um, Nyhart, who helped to put together and collect the stories of Black Elk for Black Elk Speaks. Uh, sample course outcomes. Um, this was fairly uh, simple to put together because we did have our template from our, our curriculum, our district curriculum, and performance standards and objectives from the state as well. Um, but also making sure that things like um, deepening the understanding of major genres, cultures, and themes under discussion for this particular course was there as well. And again, course outcomes may vary uh, district to district and region to region depending on who you have in your classroom. A sample reading list. Um, some of these are hard to come by, so if you have a friend known as your librarian or independent bookstore owner in town, they can help track these down. Some are out of publication and or just difficult and challenging to find. Um, but we have, of course, Dauenhauer as a reference and um, as well as Rupert and the Alaska Quarterly Review with the Alaska Native Voices. Southeast um, Sea Alaska Heritage also has a lot of material that you can um, use for your courses as well. Oops, sorry. Uh, then I have a sample reading list of fiction and poetry. The top one um, 
edited by Joy Harjo. Uh, that is a collection, the first ever Norton anthology of Native Nations poetry um, that was published in the fall of 2020, I believe. And we were fortunate enough to have enough funds to get a class set. So, a sample reading list for nonfiction and essays. Uh, of course, Fighter and Velvet Gloves is very local for us uh, in Ketchikan. And then going beyond our borders to um, N. Scott Mamaday, The Way to Rainy Mountain. Um, but then others as well that you may or may not have um, heard of or read, many classics as well as newer ones. And then sample reading lists with graphic texts. And again, I give a shout out to our high school librarian. She keeps us, uh, Catlin keeps us in the loop with a lot of things that come across her desk that we might miss but just because we're busy. Um, but um, we added uh, the graphic te text, uh, Not Your Princess, by Lisa and Mary Beth Charlie Boy. Um, there are two that are in publication right now. I think they're working on a third. And then um, Moonshot, that is the first volume of many, and it's a comic book. Um, hardcover copy book, actually. And then sample list for films and documentaries. And again, consulting with your social studies staff, and you can do a lot of cross-sharing in that regard. Um, one that is particularly powerful for our students in Ketchikan is the um, Esther Shea, The Bear Stands Up. It's only about 28 minutes long, but I have students, they're her, she's their great grandma, you know, or was her, their great granny. Um, and then um, you will have to find out if uh, the Juno UAS Campus Library should have a copy. They don't have a lot of these in circulation right now. But then the, the other one that was very powerful is Our Spirits Don't Speak English. It's the history of boarding schools in the United States and Alaska. And they have interviews with um, people from around the country and Alaska who were in boarding schools. And it's powerful in the sense that um, my students recognized their aunt and uncle or their grandmother who were interviewed and they did not know that they were even interviewed for this particular video or documentary. Oh. Okay, so I just wanted to show if you have not had to create an order list um, for finding new materials and submitting it and seeing if they will provide the funds to um, um, purchase those resources. It's the more information you have, the better. These prices were based on Amazon, which is slightly less expensive, but we tend to order our books through our local independent bookseller because she provides us with free shipping. She can guarantee that they're going to get there when we want them and gives us a 10 to 15% discount on the entire order when we order from her. So having that good connection with somebody is um, key to being able to get things in a timely manner um, as far as um, having them for the classroom when you would like to have them. But having the title of the book, having their um, ISBN number or their ASIN number, how much it is, if it's out of print, how long it can take to get it. Um, so, And then just a couple of student work samples from the course. Uh, I t first taught it in the spring of 2020 when we were under uh, COVID mitigation. We were in school full time. We were on a um, block schedule, so I had class with them 90 minutes a day, uh, Monday through Thursday. So it was a prime opportunity to really dig into the material. And um, I know that 90 minutes, you know, people have a love-hate relationship with block scheduling. For me, I love a block schedule for... Um, writing and literature. Um, I know that math teachers don't necessarily, at least at Ketchikan High School, don't necessarily um, like it, but it worked a lot for this class in, in general. And then we move on to the indigenous history of North America with Peter. 
And I'll just talk about this super briefly since we're running out of time. But at the same time that Rebecca was developing her Native American literature course, I was working on something that I felt was missing from our social studies department, which was a course that would focus on indigenous history uh, across North America, not just within um, the boundaries of Alaska or the United States. And um, if anybody has questions after the presentation, I can certainly answer them. These are just a few images from the sorts of things that we look at, our course text. Um, but I did feel that it was important thinking about these two paths, right? Whether um, you're gonna provide more integration into existing courses or specializing in creating new courses, what opportunities, what new opportunities are being offered for students that don't already exist or that are unlikely to exist in existing courses. And of course, I would love to see that every standard U.S. history course taught across Alaska and around the country includes indigenous perspectives throughout that U.S. history course. Um, but we... We'll, we'll just keep you for a couple minutes. Uh, I'm so sorry to keep you away from your lunch, but please blame the politicians and not us. Um, so <laughs> uh, I felt that creating a course that would allow students to explore indigenous perspectives across North America, from Mesoamerica um, to Canada, and throughout the lands that would become the United States, including Alaska, that that was a really important opportunity to offer to those students as uh, another social studies credit. And our conclusions. Uh, prior to this, I would like to say, though, that um, one question I asked my students for that first semester of Native American Lit, why, why are you in here? after you know, getting to know them. And I taught some of them as freshmen, so I had a comfortable relationship with them. One girl said, I'm just a redneck hick from Oregon, but everybody needs to know this information no matter what, because we're all part of the same community. Another kid said, I don't know why I'm in here. It fit my schedule, but this looks like a decent place to be. You know, so it, run, it runs the gamut, you never know, so. So conclusions, um, just what our takeaway from all of this with our experience, um, culturally relevant and place-based integration and specialization are crucial for the educational success of all students. Right? If we have that connection to where we live and how we interact with the space that we live, and that includes the culture, it enriches all of us. Um, connecting cultural, relevant, and place-based educational content beyond our borders allows students to engage locally and globally on universal topics and themes. Again, that notion that we are not just in our bubble, that people across the world have very common um, belief systems or cultural values as we do, and to embrace those. <clears throat> Positive interactions and moving forward with all staff is key to the overall success of integrating and specializing course content. Um, this is sometimes challenging. Um, getting folks out of their own classroom, out of their own area of comfortable teaching um, and adding or changing things up. And it, ta it does take a lot of work. It does take time to put something together. Um, but being positive about that and being kind and, and drawing everybody in um, will help to move it forward in a positive direction. And then integration and specialization need to be not only intrinsic but intuitive. So, and we do have our resources listed here. Um, feel free to take a photo or not or I believe all of these are going to be available to all present or to all um, participants. So, um. and, and I know we've run out of time for question and answers, but of course you can feel free to email us if you wanted more details about any of the work that we've done or things that we presented on. And then uh, 
without that question and answer time, we just have one final reflection question for all of you, and you can take this with you as you go get your lunches and enjoy your time. Um, how do you envision taking action on these sorts of opportunities? Integrating, specializing, creating new courses, restructuring the existing ones. How are you gonna take action? So with that, we'll just say, uh, how uh, do I exit Newsom? Thank you so much for your attention and participation, and have a wonderful lunch. <laughs>